What up, everybody? It's April Dawn. What up, everybody? It's April Dawn. What up, everybody? It's April Dawn. Let's talk about it. What up, everybody? It's April Dawn. Let's talk about it. This is Lord Goodbird, episode three. Okay, so this episode was pretty funny. We got to meet our character, Frederick Douglass. And when I tell you, it was a different take on Frederick Douglass, one that I've never seen before. Now, I can say that I don't know if it was Underground or another show, but there was a reference to Frederick Douglass, like, sort of being an asshole or whatever in that show. And I was like, oh, okay, so now we're going to get, like, how people really knew of Frederick Douglass, like who he was as a person. So I did a little research on this episode about the Secret Six and about Frederick Douglass. And what I found about Frederick Douglass is that some people, like he was very big on airs, he was very big on uplifting and education, and he was very big on women's suffrage. Um, He was, and he was also a character who kind of who had been seen to maybe turn away from his people because he did marry a white woman at one point after his wife died. Um, he did, that woman that was in the house, there was a white woman that lived with them from a long time. Now, people differ on whether he was sleeping with her or whether um, they were just working together. Some people say he wasn't sleeping with her and they just said that to sully his name. And then there are other people who say that they were most likely lovers. They were emotional, you know, companions or something like this. But... One thing I can say about Frederick Douglass is that from reading everything that I read about him, he had an amazing life. He had a story to tell, baby. He had a testimony, okay? So at some point, I kind of feel like when you get to a certain age, maybe he earned the right to be the way he was. He had been a slave. He escaped. He had been... He even got nominated to be the vice president and nobody even told him, okay? They didn't even ask him. They just nominated him. Um, he went all over the world. He he even fought for causes in other countries and spoke out. And like he did world tours. Now, when it comes to John Brown, he was a little shady. You know how he went about his dealings. Because if you know anything about the raid on Harper's Ferry, then you know what happens to John Brown. And that's what this whole episode is. Le I mean, this whole series is leading up to. Okay. So I know I've rambled on. But let's go ahead and get into it. So we start off with John Brown pontificating on and talking to a turtle and saying the Savior won't let those other people attack him again. They're not going to come back again. And so we see that Jeb pulls up. He's from the Federalist. Y'all remember him. And he says, listen, I turned the blind eye to your son's escape. Okay, before, like, sir, you literally brought me there to get my sons. That's cool or whatever, right? But Buchanan and somebody else got a, got a price on your head, basically, saying, like, there's a reward, you're a fugitive, um, so you need to ride with us to go to your trial to ensure that you are safe. John Brown says, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you think that my friend here is three-fifths of a person? He says, I believe that God sees us all as his children. And, sir, you've been charged with murder, property damage and Buchanan got this money on your head fam so you need to ride with us so you gonna be good and John is like basically I ain't finna ride with you and he was like look if you don't ride with me I'm gonna have to report you okay and the next time I see you I'm gonna shoot you I like the fact that they was like the gentlemanly rules of war back then or whatever like you know I'm standing right here I could just snatch you and bring you back but instead of doing that, he says, no, I'm not going to do that. The next time I see you, I'm going to shoot your ass and I'm going to kill you. So he turns around to leave and he looks back at them. It's like, I have a feeling the next time I see you, I'm going to be looking over y'all dead bodies. <laughs> then we hear a little um, voiceover from Onion talking about gunfighters. It doesn't matter what your race is. And, you know, they miserable most of the time, but there's sort of a pride in being miserable because you can kind of be your own kind of hero. But George died. Y'all remember he died on the last episode. So they get to his home and we see that his wife has a baby and John Brown has to go in and tell this woman that her husband is dead. And like, she was a G though. Like she was just like, okay. Cause he was like, nah. And she was like, okay, okay, okay. Y'all can stay in the back. You know what I'm saying? Stay in the back or whatever. He takes the baby and he's playing with the baby. And he's like, one day you're going to be so proud of your father. And you know what? When I think about that, when he said that line, I was like, you know what? That baby will grow up and be proud of his father. And that wife was a G because she knew that her husband was gone. You know, why he was going out there and possibly he could die. He could not come back, right? So I think that although she was sad, she understood what it was. It was for the cause. And so um, the, the child will be proud of their father, right? Later on in life because they sparked this whole part of the spark of the Civil War. Isn't that a great generational white story? If I was a white person, 
it would be lit. Like if I started, if my family was one of the families that was rolling with John Brown straight murking niggas behind slaves, like, like that's dope as hell. I'll be telling that story to the end of time, okay? So I don't know if all his sons died. I'm not sure. I wonder, I would like to do some research and see what happened to his family um, after that. I hope all his sons didn't die because he spoke later on about nine, a lot of his children burying, burying nine of his kids, I think he said. We see John Brown is getting a declaration about slavery and you know how they're willing to fight and die for the righteous and the winds of change are coming. And you know, he says, you need to sign a declaration, okay? This is what y'all need to do. If you rolling with me, you need to go ahead and sign this declaration, okay? Because the winds, it's feel, I feel it. The Lord spoke to me last night and he said he gave him the plan. The war is going to start, okay? All of this is going to spark a war. We're going to spark a war. He said slavery will go down. It's going to be blood, baby. It's going to be, you know, a lot of people dead and sorrow is going to visit every home. Bro was like, hey, did he give you like a time and like a place? You know what I'm saying? Did he give you directions? He says, yes, he gave me an exact time and place. But first, we need to visit the king of the Negroes. I was like, the king of the Negroes? Really? Okay. Then we see that they're on a train going somewhere to meet Frederick Douglass. And um, we talk, we hear how John Brown had many different names, but he was famous nonetheless. People knew who he was, right? So he tells the person on the train that his slave, Onion, is, you know, is with him and he wants to sit be there with him and so the man is like listen i'm gonna need for you to move that piccaninny to the other side or you you ain't him finna get thrown off this train he says hold my beer apologize he said to a piccaninny nah fam i'm not apologizing to no piccaninny somebody was like don't do that son that's john brown oh shit. john brown was like yeah boy you know what I'm saying? He was like, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brown. My bad, Mr. Brown. I was like, oh, he said Hawkins. My name is Hawkins. Get it together. Mr. Hawkins, my bad. I'm sorry. And he was like, okay, you need to apologize. And so he makes him apologize. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hawkins. He makes him give a proper apology because you knew you was going to get yoked up out here. Okay, so John Brown was really out here, you know, murking people. Like I said, I forgot when JF said you was out here doing decapitating people. You was cutting people head off. John John said he wasn't taking no prisoners. Onion had fell asleep and John wakes him up or he wakes up and he asks him about the money. So this is the money they have gotten like for donations to keep the cause going. And he was like, is this money for the men? And he was like, no, this is for my wife. And so he kind of folds up the money. So you can tell he's the man of means for the most part, and probably especially for that time. And so he says, where do you live or where are you from? And so John starts to tell the story about himself that he's a, he's from or he has a little farm and, you know, he has a nice place and his wife lives there and she makes it very special for them. And then he says, man, you rich, you got your own farm. And he was like, rich. He said, grief is his wealth. Okay, digging his pockets and grief is his wealth. So he said his first wife dug, you know, he said my first wife was whatever. And, you know, I dug her grave too. And um, he said it was raining that day or something. Same when I buried my nine children. I said, what? He was like, yeah, okay, grief. That's what I'm talking about, okay? I had lots of grief. Shame, he said dishonor, disgrace, loss of faith, um, financial ruin, and is like, man, you sound like Job. And he says, oh, you've been reading the Bible. Well, I'm so proud of you. I was like, this is a nice moment. I was, I felt it. I was in my feels. Okay, I was like, okay, I see y'all trying to, you know, come on. Now we in Rochester, New York. Okay, so we are up north, north, where the Negroes is for re-baby. Okay, y'all know in the slave, the, the, slave, the Fugitive Slave Act, I don't know what year it was, but that's like after Frederick Douglass was free. But after a while, people started running. They started getting to be free to the point where it was a problem. So that's when they made the Fugitive Slave Act where they could come and get you from the North and bring you back home, okay? So um, Rochester in New York, right? So they're at a fancy place and, and Onion is um, like looking all around at everybody, all the free black people, right? I think they even had a black child playing with some white children, probably the, the, probably the children of the servants that live in their house, but still, they wasn't out there picking no damn cotton, okay? They go to hear Frederick Douglass speak. And so this is where we get our Frederick Douglass 
um, you know, speech. He's telling, a, of talking of a nation quicken. This speech that he made is what is the 4th of July for a slave or whatever. And this speech is really famous. This is one of his famous speeches. I'm not like, like I said, I did a little bit of research. I didn't read everything about it, but I know that this is the one of the ones I saw that were very notable, was considered to be like one of the most notable speeches he ever made. So he talks about this, con the country's conscience must be roused. It must be startled. The hypocrisy must be exposed and denounced. Okay, sounds like something that needs to go on today, but I digress. So, Onion goes on about how this black man was beautiful. He had never seen this a man who looked like this. He never thought he would ever say that about a man, but he just couldn't look away from him. And he said he had never heard a black man speak like that before. And um, then we see him doing numerous different speeches, and they've gone to all these different speeches, right? I'm running him kind of make it through the crowd or whatever. And, you know, dude tells him, hey, John, be discreet. You know, don't come up in here with all that rah rah. You know, I'm going to need for you to calm it down, okay? So, John, like, it's cool. It's cool. I'm going to calm it down. So, Frederick talking, child. And then they had fireworks spouting off because 4th of July, right? So, they had fireworks spouting at the end of the um speech. And here he go with the gun. Like, I said, boy, if you don't look like John Witherspoon, I know something with that damn gun, okay, <laughs> boy? They're at the house, okay? So they done made it back to the house, and he like, what's up, man? You know what I'm saying? How you doing, fam? And so they get in the house and everything, and they immediately say something about his beard. I guess Frederick was like, I'm gonna need for you to clean all that up. Obviously, they probably stank as hell because they ain't took no bath in a thousand years, right? So he shows him... um the passage, they need to hide there because I guess he had to go do something. He was going to come back to the house later. So he was like, y'all hide right here. And Onion was like, what is that? He was like, my house is a passage through the Underground Railroad. I have helped, you know, so many slaves escape X, Y, and Z. It was like a little, this is your black history moment. Okay, Frederick Douglass' home was the house, was a part of the Underground Railroad. And I don't know, it seemed to me like if I was a slave catcher of those days, I might have pulled up on Frederick Douglass' house like, I know you got some slaves you trying to let free up here. But maybe, maybe his status, like his clout was too heavy for anybody to even try him like that. Maybe. I don't know. He tells uh, John, listen, you cannot go out while you over here. Stay in the house, okay? There's spies up here. There's spies up here. There's people that's doing all kind of shady stuff. So you need to stay up here. Stop playing. And so we see his wife greets her, him. He had a wife named Anna. And so then we see the white woman come in and she greet them too or whatever. And they kind of like going at it a little bit. What I kind of didn't like about the show today was they kind of made the women trivial and those women were very intelligent women so in their own right so like i felt like they kind of discredit those characters just for a joke but um you know i ain't gonna get too pressed about it the whole show is absurd okay so um my wife kind of go at it a little bit and so we could see some type of thruple threesome stuff going on with them already he meets onion he gets introduced to Onion. Wife and them talking about how they're going to get her together, her together, right? And going to put some clothes on her and get her a bath or whatever. So he says, hey, Mr. Fred. And he's like, Mr. Fred, what are you calling me? I'm a doctor. I got a doctor at night. It was that type of that type of vibe, you know? And so that's why I get the, he had really he had a thing about airs and, you know, putting on airs and, really being, you know, a proper negress. He's going to dress her like a proper negress of the time and all that kind of stuff. So call him Mr. Douglas, baby. He says, this is a moment. This is a moment for Onion. You know, over there eating sugar cubes or whatever, and they trying to get them together. The ladies kind of scoot them off so that the men can talk business. So they go to dress him, and they tell him to put on this red dress. And, you know, the the white woman wanted her to put on the the... the him the white woman wanted him to put on the yellow dress and the black woman was like nah don't put that dress on because yellow is not your color baby probably because he already yellow why you be yellow and put on the yellow dress okay <laughs> it was kind of shady to the white lady her name was like ola made it ola Lita or something like that y'all i ain't take time to be learning people name they had dinner and john brown is getting into this long-winded prayer so long somebody was like amen amen i'm amen hallelujah frederick was like hey you know, this is Onion's first trip up north. We should allow Henrietta, okay, to say to do the blessing. So everybody looking like... I mean, say something. Say, buy your hands. Got good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. Okay, and make it happen. But his prayer was simple. He came up with it. It was simple, and it was straight to the point. It was effective, and everybody started eating, and the night was great. 
They talk about how Onion is becoming a woman of God. You know, little Henrietta, you know. And they talk about the nasty weather in Kansas and they, how they was eating possums and raccoons. And, you know, he says, well, we're done with Kansas, you know. Um, now we, the creator has given him a greater task. And he says, um, the woman says, I, well, I grow wary of men who say they know God told them to do something because it usually it aligns with like their own desires. And then he gives a little talk about how we identify with the trivial part of us and um, not the part that's more mysterious. And he says that he says that God has taxed him with an enlightening and stands up and is like to free my people or whatever. Basically like a little spiel. Okay, for $9.99, you can take care of this child and whatever. You know what I'm saying? So we need some money, basically. Frederick is like, well, what is this money going to be used for? And he's like, it's going to be used for men. It's going to be used for provisions, for cannons. I mean, he was like, because we need to get it popped. Happened. And Frederick was like, well, what's the plan? He says, well, it will be clear when the check clear. Okay. I need you to go to the secret six and I need you to ask for some money. He's like, bro, you want me to ask the secret six for some money, but you don't give me no details? Like cut it. And then John goes to questioning him. Like he, he becomes that ally that be doing too much. Okay. Is your, shake, is your faith shaken? He says, um, he knows that slaves will take up arms, you know, to be free. They will fight for their freedom. And Frederick was like, first of all, don't you ever, as a free person who has never been owned, beaten, tortured, you know, raped, pillaged, all of that, tell me what a slave will and will not do. I think that that was a moment right there to let you know that just because you were ally, let's not let you tell, now you stepping into the role of now you think that you know what's best for us than what's best for us. It's not that I don't think that um, slaves wouldn't take up arms for their freedom. Some people absolutely would. But I also think that some people have families. And my thing is, people don't, you don't want to die. You know what I'm saying? You got a whole family, so you got to consider that. And my thing is, Think about that. You know what I mean? Like I said, John Brown just does things a lot of times and doesn't think about the aftermath. When he took Robert from his home, and matter of fact, where was Robert this episode? He must have hung back with them. He must have hung back with the crew. But yeah, so, you know, you took Robert or whatever, and you didn't even ask him. You took him away from his wife and his children. So, you know, Frederick had a point. I'm not going to lie. Homeboy had a good point. But as he's making this point, y'all... The slaves are coming in, not his slaves, they're his servants. I'm sure he pays them and hopefully he pays them well, okay? But still, the fact that you're sitting up there getting served by black people, why you talking all this noise? I was like, Frederick, I'm kind of side-eyeing you. You giving me a real O.J. Simpson tea, okay? Right now, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna say that, okay? Well, John says, you know what? I can't speak to what a slave would do. You are absolutely correct. I was wrong to say that. But what I can do is speak to the evil that's in a slaveholder's heart. His father found an escaped slave once time and he like gave him shelter and so when they found the slave or whatever they beat him with a shovel until he was dead and he said the look in their eyes it was hatred it was greed and it was fear and john i mean and frederick says i agree with you but um i will not go on your behalf i'm not gonna go so he says it's a question of method it's not a question of like are you right or wrong basically if there's war and the country comes to war that us getting a pathway to freedom and having equality is going to take even longer and so they kind of arguing about ideologies now john thinks that they should go and fight you know that the war is going to be won through blood and he absolutely turned out to be right right people had to die for slavery to actually end or whatever so and then Frederick thinks that maybe this can be achieved through a more intellectual way. But it seems like Fred be talking that noise, but he just ain't really ready. He ain't really ready to do nothing. It low-key seemed like, I'm just going to say this, and I hope nobody don't get upset. It low-key seems like Frederick Douglass have lived a comfortable life. He had been a slave his whole life. And perhaps this is what prompted him to low-key betray John Brown at the end. Because... You have been a slave. You done escaped. You done got this sweet life set up for you. You know, if the country goes into war, who knows what's going to happen to you, right? So I'm sure in the back of his mind, you have a fear that she, I can get snatched and somebody can have me back down south. Or, you know, what if they lose the war? You know what I'm saying? What's going to happen then? So, you know, all these things are probably playing in Frederick Douglass's mind, even though I saw, so I think both of them have points. 
John Brown gets up because the woman calls him crazy or whatever. You're talking like crazy. And he says he feels offended at that. You can tell this really offended him. He said, I've been calling crazy before. But he says, um, but no friendship. I will never have no friendship with no slaveholding man, okay? Like, come back to the table, bro. Just chill. Okay, okay, okay. So he kind of concedes. And then we send men talking later. They're fussing. They're arguing, you know, talking about teaching the men how to fight insurrection you're talking about insurrection and you're talking about do some speeches and like speeches ain't doing nothing Fred. so onion kind of glances over to the plans and looked at the plans that they're talking about right this is where we're talking about the raid on harper's ferry so we see the ladies they're in their own thing they're trying to you know they're arguing and they're like oh you know we'll be right back so they kind of go to get the arguing men to part to separate so they can both get their own agenda going with um fred so Fred comes in his office and he catches Onion trying to sneak a drink laying on the couch. And he's talking about he came in to tidy up. Boy, stop lying. So he sits up and he's like, well, I figured you need a drink. This drink was for you, you know, because of everything that you've been going through. I figured, you know, you would need something to drink. He says that all oh, your talk was enlightening, you know, it was so enlightening. I would love for you to educate me about the plight of our people. And so, you know, Frederick like to talk, baby. So he like, oh, you want to talk? Oh, baby, we can talk. He starts talking about the Negro shade, you know. Black, light skinned, lighter than light, light like the sun, blacker than black, black, blackity blickety, black, 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 purple black, blue black, blackity blickety black, okay, and black as tar. Oh. Like, that's how narcissistic he is when he says something good. He's like, oh, that's amazing. I'm gonna write that down. I said that. That was black as tar. I said that. I was like, Frederick, for real. And we see the love comes in, the white woman. She comes in and she tells him to stop this. Her agenda is, I don't want this to go no further. I don't want nothing to be coming back to you. I don't want you to get in trouble, you know, and you can get charged with treason. He says, well, war may be necessary for this to happen. And she's like, come to bed. I'll be in the bed with you. And, you know, you won't be able to, you know, punish me for being naughty. I was like, girl, get out of here, girl. He doing all this right in front of Onion, like filling him up, groping on him and everything, right? They take a shot when she leave, like, oh, my God. God, this is a lot. So then his other wife comes in. And, oh, what I didn't like about Frederick, though, I ain't gonna lie, was that she said, well, Onion said something to him, like, I can't even remember what he said, but he was just like, I know that you do, 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 do. But I was like, don't do that. Don't do that, Frederick. Don't do that. I ain't like that. I ain't like that at all. He says the slave, you know, knows not who they are. They don't know who their mother and father is. They don't know where they're from, you know, blah, blah, blah. He asked how many people are in John's army. And Onion is like 10, 10 people. And he was like, 10 people? Bitch, that ain't even a dozen people. Like, 10 people? That's it? So then his wife comes in and she's like, have you spoken to Lotelia, Othalithia, Orithia? He's like, what you think? He says, I need you to endorse Brown. I need you to go with whatever he going, baby. Is, is he about to tear it up? It's about to be a new world, a new life. And I need for you to just buy into it, lean into it, okay? I believe in you. I see that you are a king. Okay, you can tell that this was the wife, okay, because she was affirming him and giving him all the glory and about to rub on his thing thing, rubbing him up too. And Onion was up in there looking like, man, you getting it, you is getting it, okay, you up in here getting it how you live, player. I see you, I see you. I also read that when his wife died in real life, that he went through an intense grieving period, so he really loved that wife. Onion is trying to slide out the room and say, listen, I, I need to go, okay, I need to go. And Frederick kind of pushed up on him a little bit. You know, he did push up on him at some point, trying to, like, grab and touch because he thought he would, thought she was a girl. So I was just like, I don't know I like this version of Frederick Douglass. He wasn't that. He was kind of trash, low-key. So uh, Onion contemplates on whether or not she's going to leave. She could just, or he could just run through. I keep saying she, but y'all know what I mean. He keep running, he thinking about running through that hole. The Underground Railroad, the passage, and although he contemplates it and, and, and thinks about maybe trying to do it, he decides that he can't leave the old man. So he ends up riding off with John Brown. So um, I know that Onion lives because he said he got to take off the dress after John Brown dies. So we know he's going to live at the end. But I feel like, uh, y'all go with me. I'm not sure who he's going to turn out to be, but I feel like this boy is going to turn out to be somebody important in the civil rights movement, or not civil rights, somebody important in the abolition movement, world civil war context. Like, I was with John Brown, and I just went on this whimsical journey, and then I ended up being Martin Luther King. You know what I'm saying? Like, that type of thing. 
that's what I feel like is gonna happen. So I thought this episode was cute. It was funny. Um, I'm sorry this review is late, y'all, and it's going to be late because my schedule is off the chain, okay? Like, it changes every five minutes, and it is really frustrating being an educator at this point, y'all. I am drained. I am overworked. Like I said, it's, it's just a lot going on. But I'll just keep me in your prayers, okay? Because... Baby, I'm doing my best not to catch the corona, okay? And educate these children. Everybody else that's essential, that's back to work, that's doing their thing, I'm going to pray for you as well, all right? So, y'all be blessed. Y'all have a great week, and I'll holler at you next week. Peace.